All right, take your Bible, turn your book of Ecclesiastes. I want us to, I want us to look at something in chapter 1. Roy, this is your favorite place. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 4. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to the place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north, it whirleth about continually. And the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. God showed Solomon wisdom beyond his time. 3,000 years ago, they did not know where the waters from the rivers came from. They did not know how the sea never filled up. They did not know that. Because you can't see the water rising up from the ocean and going up into the sky and becoming... You don't see that. So, But God knew it. God told Solomon about it. Now, why am I including this? Here's what I'm going to say this, And this is to whoever it is to this morning. I don't know who it is to. That water that's over there in that Mississippi River. That's We're probably going to have a lot of flooding this year. Because all the rain we've had and all the snow they've had up north. It's going to come down on us. But that water that's in that river is the same water that was in that river a year ago. Same water that was in that river a hundred years ago, five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. It's the same water. It goes out to the Gulf of Mexico, it gets picked up into the clouds. Clouds bring back over the state of Missouri and north of that. Dumps it back into the river and it runs again. And what I'm saying to you this morning, somebody, I don't know who needs to hear this, but the very same thing that you're going through, others have gone through it in previous generations. God brought them through it. God will bring you through it. Or whatever you're in, God brought them out of it and God will bring you out of it. There is no temptation but what is common unto man. Nobody has, been ever, has ever been tempted more than anybody else in any other generation. And their stories are meant to teach us how God delivered them is the same way God will deliver us. He's the same God. Somebody say amen. Now Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. Do you believe the Bible this morning? Because I'm telling you, I mentioned it Wednesday and I mentioned it this week during Pastor Mike Online. The deceptions that are able to be shown to mankind. We're in the areas of computers now, and computers can generate images, movies, voices, that will make you think somebody said this, when in fact they never said it. Somebody years ago, 20 years ago, sent me a picture of some archaeologists, archaeologists digging up the skeletal remains of a giant. I looked at it. Did a little research. Found out that somebody had faked the image with a computer. That was 20 years ago. So I decided then that I wouldn't believe any just any picture that was sent to me of anything like that. And there are pictures all over the internet of all kinds of things that are not true. You cannot believe anything in this world except the word that God has sent down from heaven to you. And if you can't believe the Bible, listen, I don't even believe everything I come up with in my brain. I don't believe it. I lie to myself and have had the ability to lie to myself. And I don't just believe everything I think. I don't trust me. I don't trust this world. The only thing that I have put 100% confidence in is my Bible. Nothing else. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow... But woe unto him that is alone when he falleth. You will fall. You will. You can have help when you do. 
There is something there that will lift you back up when you do fall, because you're going to. For if not help, if not enough to help him. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The last Sunday, last two Sundays I preached on this last Sunday morning, God gave me a message that it would have been better for Steve to preach it. Because he would tell you just how right and true this Bible really is. And I think God made the message clear. And I think a lot of people, I, I appreciate those of you that, that came and prayed and said, God, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want to fall away from you. God, I don't want to die and go to hell. I got saved when I was young, when I was a boy, because I was afraid of going to hell. And I'm 52 years old now, and I'm more scared now than I ever was. I do not want to go to hell. So I, if the threefold cord of sin has the power to keep you from living right, then I'm going to turn this thing around and I'm going to show you how God's threefold cord can have the power to keep you from sin. And you need it. I need it. We all need it. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you, God, for the things you showed me in your word concerning this message. God, it lifted my heart up. and Father, I only wish I could have preached the message last night because I think I could have preached it better last night than what I'm going to today. But Father, it's really not up to me to say to the people, Lord, who are listening what needs to be said. And Father, I'm thankful, Lord, that you have brought people into your house today. I'm thankful, God, that we have so many that are, are watching live online through the Internet, be they in their home or their truck or wherever they're traveling. Or, Father, you have, uh, you've blessed us, Lord, with people that are sitting out in the village, out in the dark, watching us projected on a screen there in the town. I pray, dear God, that you would bless those people and bless the interpreter as he interprets what I'm saying. And Father, I'm thankful, Lord, that there are so many people that are listening in Kenya, Samburu, and Turkana. And Father, I'm thankful, Lord, that those people have now gotten used to the way I speak and how I say things and how I frame the words. Father, that they just don't need an interpreter much anymore. They can understand what I'm saying. And God, I'm very thankful for that. You've worked that out in their lives, Father, because they're hungry. For the gospel. They're hungry for the grace of God. And Father, that whoever that was that wrote in and said, it, do we have a church near Turkana? Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd bless whoever that was and help them to find a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church where they can go and attend, Father, because it's not good for any one of us to be alone. So God teaches, God, that we need these things. In our lives. We can't do it without it. Father, bless the word. Preach today. Pray to your God that you'd reach down to the hearts and lives of people, Lord. And Lord, I preach this because I love them. And I thank you, God, that you love me to preach it to me. Now, Father, these are things that I need. And I pray to your God that you'd just show us and help us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. If you ask me my opinion of what Christianity is. There's just several simple things that I suggest people do in order to make it through this life. As I said a while ago, every one of us is going to face things in life that we, we don't think that we're going to make it when we run into those things. We, we kind of hit bottom or we hit maybe a brick wall and we run into an area of life and we think, there's no, I'm, I'm done, I'm out, I'm not going to make it. I've been in those situations where I literally just... In, in one day, just God, I've lost everything. God, you've taken everything away from me. But then again, in that same day, God gave everything back. I ran into a place where I thought for a moment that I wasn't going to make it through. But God brought me through. So how is it that God can take any one of us in any situation that we run into, even if it's self-inflicted, 
Even if it's things we did to ourselves because of our own sin, because of our own lust, because of our own doings. We did these things to ourselves. We got ourselves in trouble. We dug a hole for ourselves. We're down in the pit. We don't know how to get out of it. How is it that God can carry us through these things? You could probably pick a church somewhere in this town where they're going to, you're going to, it's going to be like they're a life coach. They're going to give you seven things that you can do that'll, that'll, uh, do good in your life. Seven things that'll make you wealthy or six things that'll make your marriage better or this and that and the other. And if you've heard me preach, you know that I'm, I'm never about what it is that you must do. I'm all about what God's going to do in your life. If it's going to be done, it's going to be God that does it. He just wants you to long for the ride so you can give Him the praise and the worship for it because He's the one that's going to do it. Somebody say amen. So God is God. I call this the Christian's threefold cord. There are three simple things that if you will allow these things in your life, you will find that no problem in life is insurmountable. There is nothing that the enemy can do to bring you down. If you fall, God will use these things to bring you back up, put you on your feet, set you on your way, give you a happy life in Jesus. I don't care if you lose everything in life. God can, God can restart it again and give you new joy and new life. Somebody say amen. And again, these are things that I'm not going to tell you that they're going to, that you're going to do these things. I'm telling you, God's going to lead you into these things and it's just going to work that way. You, if you know anything about me, you, you know me that when you run into a problem, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you to go to the Bible. I'm going to tell you to read your Bible. I'm going to tell you to go to the Psalms. And read through the book of Psalms. I'm going to tell you to read the book of Proverbs. I'm going to tell you to read Revelation. I'm going to tell you to read John and 1 John. I'm going to give you scripture after scripture after scripture for you to read. And I'm not going to say, now you need to apply these things in your life. Because you're going to find out that God makes the application. Prayer and Bible reading. But I'm going to put Bible reading first. Bible reading. Prayer. Church assembly. Now. Do you have to do these things? Are these works now that we do to get saved or to stay saved? No. These are things that God will do in you. Listen, I've been in this game long enough. I know how it works. I know when somebody starts getting backslid on God, there are three things that all of a sudden are missing in their life. The first thing is always Bible reading. It's always Bible reading. When sin creeps back into your life, the Bible's the first thing to go. When sin creeps into your life, your prayer life goes. You don't pray anymore. You know why? Because you feel guilty. How can I ask God for something when I got sin in my life and I don't want to repent of it because I'm still enjoying it? You know exactly what I'm talking about. And then, all of a sudden now, you start cutting out church assembly. You said, well, I was, I was with you in spirit. You don't come because you don't want to come because there's sin in your life and you don't want to show up because you're going to feel guilty when you look around at everybody praying and everybody down to the altar crying you, because you want to keep on to your sin. Am I right so far? Have I said anything wrong so far? I know me. And I know people. And I know that when sin creeps into our life, the first thing that goes is Bible reading. First thing that goes out is the Word of God. Second thing that goes out is prayer. Third thing that goes out is church assembly. Now, I want to show you how God works in each one of these. Now, I, you, if you want to try to keep up with me as I roll through these scriptures, go ahead. But it's already quarter till. One. That's what the clock says, quarter till one. Since I'm already an hour late, I just might as well keep you for a while. Amen. I don't know if I'm going to get through all these, but I'm going to give it my best. And what I don't finish up this morning, I'll finish up tonight. Bible. The Bible is the key to your life. If you say that you love God and you love Jesus and you don't read your Bible, then you don't love God and you don't love Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus said, if I abide in you, then my words are going to abide in you. God's word must be in your life. Peter said, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Let me tell you, this book is alive. 
It is alive. It not only has life, it is alive. And when this book, these words go into your mind, through your eyes and through your ears, they go into your heart and they do things in you that you cannot do for yourself. 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul talked to Timothy and he said that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Notice that he did not say, Timothy, you must read the Bible and you must make yourself wise. He did not say that. He said, Timothy, the Scriptures are holy and they will make you wise. What is it that Jesus said about the truth? You shall know the truth and what? Who said set you free? Stand up and be embarrassed in front of everybody. He did not say set you free. He said it will make you free. You know what the difference is? Opening the monkey cage. But the monkeys have been in the cage so long, they don't know what that means. But if you reach in there and grab the monkey and throw him out of the cage, then he's It made him free. That's what God did with you. He turned the monkeys loose. Amen. Listen, the Bible is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That, by the way, I got corrected. I got corrected today in Sunday school because I said gophers cut down trees and that's what gopher wood was. That was stupid. Gophers do not cut down trees. Beavers do. <laughs> what was I thinking? This Bible will correct you, amen. You'll be, listen, you'll be wrong about a million things and God will correct every single one of them for instruction and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Your Bible will make you right. It'll make you perfect. The Bible will set you, make you free. Luke chapter 4 verse 4. Jesus answered him saying it is written that man should not live by bread alone. But by every word of God. John chapter 10 verse 35. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came. And the scripture cannot be what? Now what was that verse we were looking at? A threefold cord is not quickly what? And if one of those cords is the scripture, listen, I guarantee you, when God puts you in the Bible, you'll be there to stay. That cord cannot be broken. By the way, the Bible itself is a threefold cord. It was written by the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost. And it was written in Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek, three languages folded together into one translation. There is nothing about this Bible that is ever wrong or ever will be wrong. Rule number one, there's no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, if somebody said there's a mistake in the Bible, rule number one, cannot be broken. Matthew chapter four, turn there. When Jesus, Jesus gave us the example. He showed us how it works. When Jesus was tempted like as we are tempted, yet without sin, how was it that he was able to walk away from, or make the devil walk away from him? Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. Verse, in fact, I'll just, let me go through this very quickly. But he answered and said, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He said, it's written that way. The devil take him up to the holy city. I'm going to, I'm moving through this kind of fast. But if you look at verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So the devil tempted him again. In verse 10, Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, Him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. How'd you like for angels to come and minister to you? Say amen. How'd you like for the devil to leave you alone? Say amen. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. The Bible will keep you from sin. The Bible will make the devil go away and leave you alone. The devil cannot stand in the presence of Jesus, the Word of God, the Holy Ghost of God, God the Father. He cannot stand in their presence. He will leave when you get your Bible out. 
I'm going to ask you a question. When's the last time you read your Bible? Don't. I'm not going to nail you on that one. I'm not going to embarrass you. When's the last time you read your Bible? When's the last time you spent time with God reading your Bible? When's the last time you sat down and said, I'm going to turn the TV off. I'm going to put everything else away. And I'm going to sit down. And it's just going to be me and God with my Bible. When's the last time? And you're wondering why you're enveloped in sin. You're wondering why that threefold cord. You're scared to death that threefold cord of sin is going to drag you down to the depths of hell. And you wonder why. Get your Bible out. The Bible is, by the way, when I say Bible, I mean the Word of God. When I say Word of God, I mean Bible. This nonsense about, well, I believe the Bible contains the Word of God, but God's not bound by the Bible. You're a liar. You're a liar. Acts chapter 6, verse 7, the Word of God. Notice, notice how the Bible describes what its power is to do. In Acts 6, 4, in Acts 6, 7, the Word of God increased. What was it that increased? Was it the church? Was it, did they have more members? Did they have more people getting saved? No, it was the Word of God that increased. You say, well, I don't understand that, Mike. Well, Paul gave us the illustration in 1 Corinthians 15. This spring, you're about to see the miracle of God take place. Seeds fall to the ground. And what does it take from man to get them to do what they're supposed to do? Not a thing. When the seed is planted, the seed will do all the work for you. That's what I'm telling you. It's the Bible that will do it. And you'll hear preachers say, now this must be applied. You've got to take this and apply this in your life. I'm saying just read it and believe it. And the word of God will increase in your life. Acts 12, 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Acts, what did your mama do to bring birth to you? Nothing. Well, almost nothing. But once the seed was planted of you... Your mama did nothing. You did nothing. It does what it's supposed to do. It will work in your life. Acts 19.20 So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Romans 10.17 So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You say, I'm, I'm having a problem believing the Bible. Read it. Read it. The more you read it, the more you'll believe it. And as life goes on, there will be things that will happen that when it does, the Holy Ghost will say, remember that verse I showed you the other day you didn't think was, you didn't think was right? Guess what? It's right. And you just saw it. You just saw how that worked. Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. The Bible, uh, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Open your Bible up to that verse and underline that verse. You received it not as the word of men. I'm sick and tired of these guys, these liars on YouTube and these liars on the internet and these liars in every church. Well, the Bible was written by men. Okay, yes, a man took a pen in his hand and wrote down the words, but God gave them the words to write. Well, the Catholic Church, they, they took out books that should be in the Bible. No, if God didn't want them in the Bible, guess what? They're not in the Bible. But if God, if, if God wanted it in the Bible, guess what? It's in the Bible. Every word of God is where it's supposed to be, and it does what it's supposed to do. God said, my word does not return unto me void. It will accomplish the thing that I sent it out to do. And he said, the word of God effectually worketh also in you that believe. Raise your hand if you've got a testimony 
of how the Word of God did something in you that you could not have done yourself. He didn't say you had to apply it. He said you had to believe it. A little faith can go a long way. This is part of that threefold cord that if you will allow it into your life, it cannot be broken. 2 Timothy 2, 9, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. We found out that when we had this software made up called the Pure Bible Search software, purebiblesearch.com, we found out that it's being downloaded in places where it is illegal to own a Bible. If Kim Jong-un doesn't want a Bible in North Korea, God's going to put a Bible in North Korea. You can't... Listen, Kim. I don't know why you're doing with a woman's name anyway, Kim. But listen, Kim. You say there's no Bibles in North Korea? I guarantee you, they're there. You just don't know where they are. And God won't let you see them. And they'll do things you don't want them to do. Somebody say amen. And I'm going to tell that to the ACLU and to all the liberals and everybody else in this world that doesn't want Bibles anywhere. I'm telling you, the Bible, God will, God will put the Bible where He wants the Bible. Amen. amen. Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is quick. You know what that means? That's what Clint Eastwood said it means. The quick. It means it's alive, amen. It's alive. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know what that means? In the book of Proverbs, the Bible talks about a strange woman, a whore, a woman with an evil tongue, like your sister-in-law or somebody. <laughs> a woman that's got a sharp tongue that don't know how to keep her mouth shut, and she thinks she's right on everything. He said, her mouth is like a two-edged sword. And Paul just said the Bible is sharper than that. So when you've got that woman go going off like this and she won't shut up and she's just trying to knock down your faith and your belief, give her the Bible. Oh, she'll get mad at you. She'll hate your guts. I don't care. Amen. It'd be worth it just to see her blow a gasket or two. Amen. <laughs> Did you know Hebrews 4.12? The Bible is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You read your Bible, all of a sudden you start figuring people out. You're puzzled at why they're doing what they're doing. You read your Bible, all of a sudden God is showing you something. By the way, that applies to you as well. God will show you what you've been thinking. God will show everybody else what you've been thinking. Hebrews 11.3 Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Did you know that before the creation, there was absolutely nothing, nothing. And God spoke, and there it all was. If the word of God, spoken by God, has that much power, what is it that you say God cannot do? So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Two things in this verse. Number one, you're wrong if you don't know it from the Bible. If you don't know it from the Bible, you're wrong. We did not come from monkeys. We did not come from monkeys. They are wrong. Because they don't believe the Bible. But the second thing is, the Bible is the power of God. If you wonder why we don't, in our church service, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I don't mind you clapping your hands every now and then. I don't mind you stomping your feet every now and then. Keep it in the beat. Or keep it out of beat, I don't care. But did you know why we don't emphasize the worship service as the main draw to our church? Because the power is not in the music in this church. The power is in the Word of God. Any church can get you lifted up with music, 
But does that music have the lifelong impact and make the changes in your life that is necessary for things to be all right between you and God, between you and your husband, between you and your wife, with your children? Does the music make everything right in your life? No, it's the Word of God that does that. John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. What's my favorite slogan? Think Bible. When you don't think you're saved, who do you ask? God. And he'll show you in the Bible whether or not you're saved. Did you know there's been people who've gone to church all their life, thought they were saved, they had a revival, they read their Bible, all of a sudden God showed them they had never been saved. They got saved. I'm talking about deacons. I'm talking about pastors' wives getting saved. Because they thought they were saved, but they were thinking wrong. And they started reading their Bible and they found out they had never, they had never submitted to God. Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things are written for time, were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Revelation 19, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called what? The Word of God. Where is the Word of God? Look up here on the screen. See this little long-haired hippie king? This is actually, if I'm right, this was the king that... Um, who was that guy, that Puritan leader in England? Oliver Cromwell was a Bible-believing Christian man in Parliament. And he knew that the king of England was going diametrically opposed to the scriptures. God gave that man so much power, even military power. The king of England mustered his troops, the greatest fighting force in the world, against Oliver Cromwell and his troops. And Oliver Cromwell beat him. And then they arrested the king of England and cut his head off. And Oliver Cromwell said, from now on, the nation of England will be led by the word of God alone. What is he holding in his hand? What do they call that? You know what that represents? It represents, I have the power. Well, apparently it didn't work too well. They cut his head off. You know what Oliver Cromwell had? King James Bible. Revelation 5.1, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, what? God does not hold a scepter. God holds a book. And it's the very book. Turn to 1 John 1. 1 John, turn there. Turn your Bibles there. 1 John. It's probably in my notes. No. First John. Chapter 1. Let me, show you, let me show you what God did for you. That, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now what he's saying to you is that wherever the word of life is, you're able to hold it in your hand. And I've had, I've had preachers, I've had Bible college professors, and I've heard people say, well, the Word of God is Jesus Christ. That's the real Word of God. There are mistakes in the Bible, so the Word of God cannot be the Bible because we say there's mistakes in it. No, there's mistakes in your theology, there's mistakes in your mind, there's mistakes in your heart, but there is no mistakes in the Bible. God doesn't make mistakes and God does not lie. God is not like us and God cannot lie. My Bible cannot lie to me. And it will not lie to me. It will always tell me the truth, especially when it comes to me. What I'm saying to you this morning is that if you're wrestling against the threefold cord of sin in your life, and you are. There's somebody here this morning, I told you, I told you that the biggest battle that you were going to face, the biggest enemy that you were going to deal with was your flesh. And I mean it. 
And I say that to you in love because I know it personally. My biggest enemy is my flesh. And the lust of my eyes, the lust of my flesh, and the pride of life. They are my biggest enemies. And if it wasn't for the Word of God, I wouldn't be here today. I want all God's people to say amen if you believe that the Word of God is the reason why you are and who you are, what you are today. Somebody say amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Here's the second chord. The second part of the chord. This is a threefold chord. Prayer. Now I want to ask you. I want to ask you a question. Do you? I, I asked you a while ago. Did you read your Bible? I'm talking this week. Did you read your Bible? Number two. When's the last time you prayed? I don't mean God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. That never did rhyme. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. When's the last time you prayed? When's the last time you stopped what you were doing and knelt before God? When's the last time you fasted? When's the last time you had an issue of life and, and rather than you trying to deal with it and get involved and mess it all up? I, listen, I have such low confidence in myself, in most areas of life. Now, if you want to psychoanalyze me, maybe it's because I got beat up, or maybe because the kids didn't like me, or I didn't feel I didn't make the football team, or whatever. But it comes from years of knowing the mistakes that I made by trying to do it myself. I've hurt the people I love. I've said things that I never should have said. Done things I never should have done. Been part of things I should have never been a part of. And all because I did not pray. The book of James says you have wars among you. Why? Because you have not. You have not because you asked not. You did not pray. You want to complain about the politicians of this country? It's our fault for not praying that God will give us godly politicians. Listen, I like some of the things the president's doing, but that man is wicked. That man's got a wicked heart. That man has, has gone and approved sodomy all over this country. He's not on my happy list right now. And the shame of it is that we had to have a godless, wicked man stand up and do the, some of the things for our country that some of the so-called righteous Bible believers, politicians never did. They never did it. All because we did not pray. Now, look at, look at this. Look what I got up on the screen. Psalm 55, 17. Evening, morning, and at noon. How many times is that? Threefold cord. Daniel, he kneeled upon his knees. How many times a day? Three. Threefold cord. Second Corinthians 12. For this thing I besought the Lord. How many times? Three times. I'm going to ask you a question. When's the last time you prayed for something more than once? Now I say, oh pastor, I've heard you say that you can pray for something one time and, and God will listen. Yeah. But isn't it worth more to you than just praying for it one time? Maybe you know somebody, their heart ain't right with God and you're afraid they're going to die and go to hell. Well, I prayed for them that one time and they never did get saved. So I guess, I guess God didn't hear me or God didn't answer that prayer. Pray again. Don't you love them? Don't you care about them? Then why don't you pray? Pray. Three times. Pray three times. Pray evening, morning, at noon. He, his knee, he, he, Daniel prayed three times. Daniel prayed three times a day when he found out they outlawed it. He prayed three times a day. Daniel opened the window, sat down next to the window in his house, knelt and prayed so everybody could see him pray. He said, you can outlaw prayer you want to and throw me in the lion's den. I'm going to pray. By the way, how'd that work out for Daniel? How'd it work out for the people that outlawed prayer? 
I'm saying to you, pray. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of? For who? If you're, if you're sitting here and you are lost today, you can be in this house and pray to God. Job 33, 26, he shall pray unto God and he will be favorable unto him. He shall see his face with joy for he will render unto man his righteousness. God will be favorable to you if you pray. Psalm 5, 2, hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. Prayer is the religious act that we do. We pray. Prayer is us asking God for favors. Asking God for help. Asking God for mercy. Asking God to help us pay our bills. Help, ask God to help us where the doctors can't help us. That's prayer. That's what we do. Psalm 5, 2. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and God, for unto thee will I pray. Psalm 32, 6. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him if you pray. Godly people pray. And by the way, Psalm 32, you know what that the context is? When you sin. Remember what I said. When you're in sin... The first thing that goes is Bible reading. Because you don't want God saying anything to you about your sin. The second thing that goes when you are in sin is prayer. Because you don't want, because you, you think, well, I can't ask God for this. I can't ask God for that. I can't, I can't go bother God. I got sin on my heart. God won't hear me when I got sin on my heart. And I don't want to let go of sin. So what do we do? We sin and don't pray. So that's what happened. And so in Psalm 32, he said, when you got sin, you confess it unto God. God will wipe it away. And now you're a godly person because you prayed and asked God to forgive you of your sins. Psalm 21, 22, in all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing ye, what? Shall receive. Does that Bible, you see, as I was growing up, I kept hearing about all these charismatics and how they all said, name it, claim it, name it, claim it. God will give you everything you ask for. And I, and I kind of got mixed up. I, I would say... Well, it doesn't work that way. Well, how does it work? I don't know. And then over the years of running into trouble in life, God finally taught me, Mike, I didn't lie here. My word's still true. If you'll pray and ask me, ye, notice what he said. I want, he said, ye shall receive. Now, do you believe your Bible? Does God lie? So what's he going to do? I've, I've said it before. I'm saying he's either going to give you what you asked for or give you better what you asked for. God does not tell people no. Ever. He does not tell us no, people. We got people praying for lost husbands. We got people praying that are dying of cancer and want to, be, want to be healed from it. I'm just telling you, God has an answer to that prayer that's either what you ask for or it's better than what you ask for, but you got to trust God. And by the way, prayer means you trust God. Because if you don't trust Him, you won't ask Him. Now, how do you build trust? Read your Bible. When you read your Bible, you'll start trusting God more. You'll start praying more. All things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. That's not a charismatic doctrine. That's not a word faith Pentecostal doctrine. That is a Bible doctrine. Start asking God for big things. Start asking God for little things. I spent three days in 2008 asking God to do something with this church. And we're set to distribute nearly 5,000 pounds of food in less than two weeks. I didn't ask God for that. 
never crossed my mind. I just asked God to do something with this church. And he did something all right. Now, if you think that I deserved to have that prayer answered, I know I didn't. My wife knows I didn't. My sister knows I didn't. She shouldn't know, but she knows. I didn't deserve to have that prayer answered. I did not deserve to have any prayer answered. But I got to the point, guys, that I said, I can't. My wife knows that I was ready to quit. 2008 would have been it. I'd have been done. So when I didn't have anything left, I prayed. John and Melissa are here because I prayed. My sister's here because I prayed. Many of you are here because I prayed. And God blessed it better than I asked. So if you'll believe and trust God, and just ask Him, what do you got to lose? Except, of course, giving up the sin that's keeping you from praying to begin with. And let me tell you, it's worth it. It's worth it, people. When you ask God for something, and then lo and behold, boom, it does, it happens right then and there, and you're just going, I can't believe that. Or when you ask God for something, you got to wait for it, and you start thinking, well, maybe, I, maybe, maybe God's not going to do that. And then lo and behold, boom, it's better than what you asked for. I'm telling you, giving up that stupid sin of yours is worth asking God. And if you feel you can't give it up, ask God for help. Because it's a threefold cord that's going to lift you up out of the pit. There's actually a picture of that in your Bible, and I don't have it in my notes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit preaching now. I'm going to lay the rest on this this afternoon. The rest of this, I'm going to finish up with prayer, and I'm going to get into church attendance. Now, you may not like it when I preach stuff like that. I can't. I have to. We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And I'm telling you, there is... Sister Betty said it this morning. She said, yeah, I got the tapes to listen to, but it's just not the same as being here. We have a visitor here for the very first time this morning. She's been listening and watching online. I'm hoping that when she goes home today, she thinks it's better being there. That's my hope. Okay? My hope is that today's experience made it worth you coming. Okay? So, guess what we're going to do? We're going to pray.